If you brought your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me this morning to the book of Philippians chapter 1, the book of Philippians chapter 1, um, as we continue in our uh, journey through uh, this New Testament book, is a book uh, that is written by uh, the Apostle Paul, um, one that is written, I think, some two-thirds of the New Testament, and uh, this is a letter that he has penned to the church at Philippi. Uh, he's done so while he is there in prison uh, in Rome, and uh, that is the backdrop for uh, the letter that we will read here in just a moment. If uh, I want to just take a moment, I don't do this often, but I will this morning, uh, if to welcome those that are watching online. Thank you for joining us. I know we have a faithful uh, number of you that do so on a weekly basis, and then also many of our folks as they travel um, we'll, we'll log in and uh, watch. And so I think there's about somewhere in the neighborhood of about, what is there, 7 billion people um, that are on the planet today. And 74.9% uh, of them have access to the Internet. You say, where'd that number come from? 85% of statistics are made up on the spot. So that was just my number that I used. And so there's potential of us reaching about, you know, what, 5 billion uh, people out there this morning, and I don't know if they're all online right now, but uh, to that handful that is, hey, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we really are honored that you would uh, uh, worship with us there in your home or wherever you are. So if you found your place, stand with me if you would to honor the reading of the word. Um, if you are um, new here at Crescent Valley, and you may be wondering, well, why we just stood up, then sat down, now we stand back up. What are you doing? Is this like Jesus size uh, or something? That no, it's not. We're not doing this because we get you know bonus points for standing. We really do it because uh, we we reverence the Word of God. We we are uh, most grateful that we have the Word, and uh, uh, as we read from it, uh, more powerful and and uh, of greater importance than anything that I will say is that which God has said in his word. And so this morning, we're picking up our reading in verse 19 of Philippians chapter 1. If you found it, say, uh-huh. That was terrible. That was terrible. Okay, so if you found your place there, say amen. amen. That was, it was weak, but it was better. I'll take it. The Bible says, verse 19, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. By the way, if you were looking for a life verse, I hear people from time to time, hey preacher, could you pick me out a life verse? What well, would be a good one? That'd be a good one, amen, uh, to hang your hat on. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart, important word there, and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith." that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Lord, we love you, and we ask that you'd speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So this morning I'm going to speak to you on this subject, crossroads and side streets. Crossroads and side streets. I'll explain here in a moment uh, what I'm doing with that and that theme. But before I do, I want to read to you, and I don't do this often, but from time to time I will uh, read the message. I don't know if any of you have a copy of the message. It is not considered to be a, a, a translation 
uh, per se, and so I don't want anybody writing me an email and calling me a liberal. Um, but but it, it, it's it's what it is is it's it's more of a paraphrase helping us to 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 get a grasp on uh, a text. And so sometimes it's good to go over there and 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 I read that to just kind of get a different perspective on uh, maybe the text that I have been studying. Um, I, the 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 author of the message, man by the name of Eugene Peterson, just a matter of fact, just went home uh, to be with the Lord uh, this past week, and man, his contribution. Uh, to the church has just been unbelievable. I messed up when I told somebody about that this week. I said that um, uh, Adrian Peterson went home to be with the Lord. And they go, what? Are you kidding me? And it's like, he looks so young and healthy. And then I caught what I said. It's not Adrian, it's Eugene. Um, and so I thought you OU fans would know who that was, but you forgot him. So let me read this to you. It, 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 I think it'd be, be helpful. I had a fit. Wednesday, when, this was Wednesday, whenever I read this, I had a fit in my office when I read. L- listen to what he said. Starting here again, Philippians chapter 1. Here's, here's what he said, said in here. He said, and, and I am going to keep the celebration going because I know how it's going to turn out. Through your faithful prayers and the generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, everything he wants to do in and through me will be done. What a faith statement, Amen. Everything he wants to do in and through me will be done. He said, I can hardly wait to continue on my course. I don't expect to be embarrassed in the least. On the contrary, everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known, regardless of whether I live or die. Now, I want you to listen to this. He said, they didn't shut me up. They gave me a pulpit. Isn't that good? In other words, they, they tried to, 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 to stop my message, and really all that they did was give me a platform to stand on to proclaim Jesus till I die. I can tell you aren't going to help me one bit today. Alive. I'm Christ's messenger. Dead. I'm his bounty. Life Versus even more life, I cannot lose. As long as I'm alive in this body, there is good work for me to do. If I had to choose right now, I hardly know which I'd choose. Hard choice. The desire to break camp here and go be with Christ is powerful. Some days I can think of nothing better. But most days, because of what you're going through, I'm sure that it's better for me to stick it out here. So, I plan to be around a while, companion to you as your growth and joy in this life of trusting God continues. You can start looking forward to a great reunion when I come to visit you again. We'll be praising Christ and enjoying each other. Paul, as we have saw throughout the scriptures here in this wonderful book, has what is theologians call the single mind. In other words, anything and everything that comes along his way, he filters it through the fact that I am here for one purpose, and that is to serve Jesus. Let me just encourage you in this. The single mind, as is described here in the text, radically translates a different kind of lifestyle. It radically uh, shifts our focus. It radically changes our perspective. To have the single mind is to say that anything, everything that comes my way, whether it be good times or bad, whether it be uh, pain uh, or, 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 or joy, whether it be uh, cancer or complete health, I'm going to praise Jesus in the midst of it. As a matter of fact, God will use it, all of it, listen to me, all of it for the furtherance of the gospel. And so well, this morning what I want to do is I want to walk through the text and share with you uh, some, some, some scenes in Paul's life uh, that, that, that come about that helps us, I think, to live with the single mind. And, and here's the facts. Most, if we're just honest, there ain't nobody else here but us. We struggle with that. I do. Why? We have a lot of things pulling for our attention, right? Do you not during the week? Do you have... Uh, not a, a dozen different things that want your attention, want your affection. Uh, I think vast majority of us would wrestle with the very same thing. What Paul is helping us to, to, to learn how to do is to bring them back through the filter of what does this say about Jesus? What does it say about my relationship with Jesus? And 
lastly, how can this help others to come to know Jesus? So number one, I want you to notice Paul's concern in verses 19 and 20. Paul's greatest concern was this, was that he would have nothing to be ashamed of when he stood before the Lord in judgment. I would to God that that would be our concern primarily. I mean, think about how that might uh, shift your attitude on any given day. Think about how that might shift your, 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 your words in, in interacting with a coworker or maybe even somebody in the church. That, that, that your greatest desire is that you would stand before the Lord one day in judgment and not be ashamed. He said in verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so that now in also Christ would be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. First John chapter 2, verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. John helps us to understand this truth that it is quite possible to be a Christian, go to heaven when you die, and all the while be ashamed at his appearing. I thought you might be quiet at that. I was quiet as I'm studying it. It is possible. I think there's a myth among us that would say, man, just as long as I get in, as long as I make it to heaven, that's enough for me. I believe the Bible would also help us to realize the truth that it is quite possible for one to go to heaven when they die, but stand there at the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. You all understand that there's two different judgments, right? I'm not trying to uh, challenge your intellect because I know that you, 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 you have more than I but there are two judgments the Bible speaks of. There's the great white throne judgment, and then there is the bema or the beam of the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the great white throne judgment is the judgment in which all uh, of those who are non-believers, those who have not play, repented, put their faith and trust in Jesus, they will stand there. And here's what's happening at the great white throne judgment. You're judged according to your sins. And by the way, in case you were wondering if you'd do okay at that one, you won't. The Bible says, for all of sin falls short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. So you're judged according to your sin and then cast into the lake which burns with fire. The second one, the, the bema, the beam of the judgment seat of Christ, it's a totally different judgment. The, that, that judgment is one where those who are in Christ, repentant of sin, put their faith in Jesus, they are judged not according to sins, but according to works. So radically different. Sins have been taken care of at the cross. Is anybody, could I at least get somebody happy about that this morning? Just at least a couple of you, okay? Just make sure I'm talking to at least some saved folk this morning. We should be thrilled about the cross. We should be thrilled about the, 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 the empty tomb. We should be thrilled about the fact that it, his blood covers my sin. Matter of fact, it takes away sin. Christ came and died so that I would even know that I have eternal life. If you can't get happy about that, my, my soul, you, 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 you don't know the Jesus of the Bible. Let me put it that way. That's bold, but that's, that's really the truth. But at the Bema, our works are judged. And here's how the Bible would describe this, is that those things which are good and those things which are pure, they, they go through the refiner's fire. And, and, and all the refiner's fire does is refine them even more, brings out the purities of those things. And those will be our rewards. We are given those crowns, and we, we will eventually at a point we will cast them at Christ's feet because they're not about us. They're about crowning him uh, as prophet, priest, and king, and that's who he is, okay? But it's quite possible that we would come there and, 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 again, be in. That's the word, in, but you have nothing to show for it. This impacted my life greatly uh, as a, uh, I was going to say as a young man, but I'm just going to say as a younger man, I'm still young, um, younger man, in my faith that I, I had a dream, and I know that kind of freaks some of you out. We're not the dream people. Well, I had a dream, okay? Just get over it. And, 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 and in this dream, um, uh, God just showed me so clearly a picture of, uh, in my little mind, what the, what the Bama was going to be. And the impact of it was is that if I continued to live in such a way as to just to blend in with 
Christians, that's exactly what I was going to inherit one day was the fact that I would stand there without anything to show for it. Can you think with me for just a second? And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to not belabor the point, but could you imagine standing before the one who gave his life for you? Standing before the one that endured a, a beating that many would say would last throughout an entire day. Because those that are beating on you would have to stop and take breaks. Flesh torn from, your body, from his body. Imagine standing before the sinless son of God and have nothing in regards to life to show for it. That all you were concerned about was getting in. Man, what a tragic moment. What a, what a, a life wasted, opportunity wasted. What Paul is saying here to this church, and I think encouraging us to come under this conviction of, is that we too might have that concern. And, and here again, if Paul's concerned about this, could we at least not say we, we might want to stop and consider it? Did y'all go through a class that said, hey, don't talk back to the preacher this morning? Did they, like, threaten you in the lobby? Would you agree we should consider it? Paul had a concern for the church that they not come to that place to where it's just about getting in. But on that day, that it would be a glorious day. Because if we'd flip the script, think about it now. That you live life on earth in such a way that as you stand before him, you do so with anticipation. You do so with joy. You do so with gladness. Why? Because you've lived your life for him. You've led your friends to faith in Jesus. You've invested in the kingdom. You've, you've got something to look forward to and long for when you stand there to come to a day of rejoicing. Why? Because I've given everything I have, everything I am, all for the glory of Jesus. You won't get that, by the way, blending. You just won't get it. So many of us, that's, that's all we're concerned. I just want to blend. I don't want to stand out. I understand that. I get it. The easiest thing you can do today is blend. Let me, let me help you with blending. Don't cuss in the lobby. You don't even really have to be all that faithful in, in attendance to church, you really don't. If, if you came once a month, you could blend. Um, you really don't even have to give. You, you, you could rob God every week of your life, and you, you'd still blend. Why? vast majority of anybody, they ain't going to have a clue what you give, just between you and the Lord, right? Um, you don't have to win any of your friends to Jesus. You, you, you don't have to... You don't even have to really be all that kind. And all you really, blending here, um, if somebody asks you, hey, where do you go to church? Oh, I'm Crescent Valley. Oh, yeah, bless God. Amen. That's where I go. Then all you have to do is just go live your life. Um, uh, you, you don't really even have to be all that faithful to your spouse. You, your, your kids could be uh, quite wild and, and, and uh, I mean, you could raise little hellions if you wanted to. And you could blend. Here's my heart as a pastor. I don't want you to blend. He's called us. Here's what the Bible says. He's called us to be a, a peculiar people. It's called the doctrine of separation. It's rarely taught anymore. That we're not just to come and just fit in the groove. We're not to just come and just look like everyone else. We're called to be God's peculiar. Another translation calls us special. Some would go so far as to say Ah, a bunch of those weirdy Christians. I'm not calling for weirdies. But I am calling for those that are radically sold out for the sake of kingdom work. I, I, I didn't completely get all of that whenever I first was saved because I thought that the only way a person could serve Jesus full time was to, to be a preacher. That was it. And I've come to realize that is an absolutely false uh, belief 
I, I think it literally in anything and everything that you do, Adrian Rogers taught me this years ago, and it's uh, so helpful to me in his teaching with this, that it, literally what the, the scriptures would give us is that anything and everything that we do, regardless if you're selling cars or if you're a banker or, or, or if you're a, a, a school teacher, whatever, it, it's that you do so as though you are doing it for Jesus. Whatever you do. Now, let me help you with what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean just don't cuss at work. You remember that the, the mission here is, is that I'm trying to get as many people to come to heaven with me as possible. As many people to come to know Christ with me as possible. And guess what? You will not win them to Jesus blending in at work. Are there risks involved? Yes, i.e. go look at Paul. He lost his head over this. Go look at the apostles. They lost their lives over this. Why? They weren't blending in, but they were living life in such a way that they wanted to bring everybody that they could to the saving faith in Jesus Christ. I think one of the great marks of whether or not we are maturing in our faith, I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. I hadn't planned on this. This is free. One of the great marks is whether or not we are maturing in our faith. Is anybody coming to know Christ because of me? I really didn't think you'd talk back after I said that. Here's why I want to go a little bit further. Since I, I don't know whether you're mad this morning or, or what, but, but if you are, let's go ahead and poke the bear. Um, if you live your entire life, quote, unquote, for Jesus, and nobody's coming to faith in Christ because of how you're living your life or who you're sharing, you're wasting your life. You are, I'll go a step further since you've got me worked up over this. You're not following Jesus by doing that. I didn't say whether you were saved or not. That's, not. that's not my call. But I'm saying you're not following him. To follow him is to emulate him. To follow him is to be an apprentice under him. An apprentice does that which the master has taught him to do. To live is Christ. In other words, everything I do, everywhere I go, my life is centered on the fact that I am worshiping Him. And the greatest single act of worship I can give to Him is by how I administer the gospel to others. I don't know what happened to my talking church, but you guys got a case of the lockjaw this morning. Amen, preacher. Come on with that. There are a lot of people who are talking about the coming of the Lord that are just simply not ready for the coming of the Lord. Preacher, are they saved? Yeah, I think some of them are. But I am afraid that they're going to be ashamed that he's appearing. It is my great desire as your pastor that every one of us stand before him so anticipating his appearing. All of us have people in our life that we are excited about seeing that haven't been seen by us for a while. Uh, we are excited that we found out uh, this last week that our son, uh, Coy, who's in the Marine Corps out in Arizona, is uh, getting to come home this Christmas, and uh, we'll get to spend a week or so with him. And we're excited. We're anticipating that. We're, we're with joy. We're looking forward. We've all got people in our life that with joy we, we look forward to. Uh, there's nobody in our life that we should have more anticipation and looking forward to seeing than Jesus. Can you imagine the one you've lived for to see him face to face one day? That, 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 that there be a moment in time where you could literally stand, Steve, before him and the, the one that has given his life for you, the one you've, you've sang songs about, the one you've prayed to, you've talked to for, for, for an, a lifetime, to all of a sudden be standing before him. What a, what a day. What a moment in time that that will be. Yet if I've lived my life in such a way that it's all about me and my life and my lifestyle and my wants and my desires. It's going to be a day of, of sorrow. It'll be a day that we will, it will be tough. The Bible talks about that. He will wipe away all tears. Because some would immediately push back on this, and that's fine. You can. Hey, I thought that heaven would be a place of no, no sorrow. 
We're not talking about heaven yet. We're talking about the judgment. He said he would wipe away all tears. Why? Because I think that there's going to be some tears at this judgment. For seeing a life that had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to live for Jesus. And we did not. Paul also had a crisis. And I, I'm, I'm trying to hurry through this. But y'all are, y'all are kind of making me prime the pump this morning and as well as pump on the handle. You'll get that later. No, your Bible says in verse 21... Talking about the word or in the, in the, where it says that, that, that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you'll notice in your Bible that the word is, is in italics. Have you noticed that? The word is, is in italics. What that means is it's not in the original uh, manuscript. It's been added to give a, a more clearer understanding of what it is. So in other words, the, the, the original translation of that would read, for me to live Christ and to die gain. That's the whole philosophy of the Christian life is to live Christ and to die gain. Dr. William Pettingill used to say that gain is always more of the same thing. So in other words, if to live is Christ, then to die would be more of Christ. It means to, to go and be with him. Warren Wiersbe said that the most important thing in my life as a Christian is to have the reality of Jesus Christ in my life. It's not too popular of an opinion today. Why? Because people would rather talk about being dedicated or wanting to serve him or doing this or that. And all those are good things. But the most important thing is to have fellowship and communion with him so that our joy might be full. Now, before you, 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 you get worked up about that, the outcome of that is a powerful witness. I cannot, listen to what I'm saying, I cannot spend time, commune with the heavenly father and not come out of that as a witness for the father. That's how he so translates my, or transforms my life. I can't hang out with him without coming out and saying, I've got to tell you what Jesus said. I've got to tell you what he's done in me. I've got to tell you what he's done for me. So somebody, listen to me, since I've, I've, I've got you, I, don't, I may get a bunch of emails this afternoon, I don't know. You all seem out of sorts, but if, if, I am that one that has never shared and would not share doing nothing in regards to bringing my friends to or, or anyone to Jesus. I'm going to make you or, or come to a point of saying, hey, you need to really ask the question, do you know him? And by the way, if you do, have you hung out with him lately? Have you spent time with him lately? Because, and we, by the way, one of the greatest ways we can do that is in the Word. And as I read, read my Bible, I start reading about the things even that he's just, if I personalize this, the things he's done for me, he's redeemed me, he's set me free, he's forgiven me, he's given me life. Uh, David described it as I was, I was sinking in, in deep in the, the, the mire and the clay and the sand. And he said, he snatched me up, set my, my feet upon a solid rock. Uh, he, he's, he's, he's come and he has, has given me new life. He's set me free. The list could go on for eternity how in the world could I spend time with him and not come out of that saying man you too can know him you too can experience him just as I have experienced him the problem is that most want the end meaning that powerful witness without dealing with the means and the means is fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ this is why your quiet time is critical this is why daily you need to spend time in the Word and spend time in prayer talking to Him. Paul, as we read of his story, was not concerned or afraid, rather, of death or life. Either way, all he wanted to do was to magnify Christ in his body. And no wonder he had joy. No, no, no wonder this guy would find himself sitting in jail cells singing while he's bleeding. No wonder here's a guy that after he had taken a, a beating would want to win his tormentors to faith in Christ. He had already died. He had already come to that place to say, my life is not mine any longer. Could you imagine of how much, better yet, how little of our New Testament we would have today had Paul bought into 
what many would say is 21st century American Christianity. That Paul's greatest concerns was getting likes on Facebook and retweets on the twit. Could you imagine if Paul had gotten so concerned with his 401k? Paul was just concerned with his business. Paul was just concerned with his sports team. Paul was just concerned with all of those things that pour into the pleasures of life. Could you imagine how little of our New Testament we may have today? But he didn't. Paul had the single mind, whatever comes, may Jesus be glorified. He used the word death and departing. It's an interesting word. It's a word that is used by, uh, and there's several different translations you'll find, but one is, is used by soldiers of, of tearing down the tent. It simply means to take down the tent and move on. In other words, he's saying that there's coming a day that I'm just going to take down the tent. This is temporary, right? That's, that's what a tent is designed for. It's a temporary dwelling and he said, there's coming a day that I'm tearing this sucker down and I am moving on. I'm going to be with him. There's another translation that would, would use the, the, the word to loosen a ship or to set sail. Why? Because ships were not designed to stay in the harbor. But yet they had a mission. And one day he said that I would loose the ship and let it go. The word departure also had a, a political meaning. It means to... Set free a prisoner. We relate with that because we know that without Christ, we too are in bondage to our sin. We also know that even in Christ, we are in bondage to the limitations of our own flesh, our own bodies. But one day, one day, there's coming a day, whether by the return of Christ or whether by the fact that we die physically, we're going to be set free. That's why at a Christian funeral we don't come and mourn as those who have no hope. But we come even though with heavy hearts because we miss them. We can rejoice because we have hope in Christ that really what's happened to them should be the desire for everyone who's in Christ because I will shed off this old tent that has held me back. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more grief, no more cancer, no more politics, no more pain. So you say amen because I said politics. I know what you're doing. There's just coming a day saying, I will be free. I will be free. Let me give you the last one. We'll be done. And I know that I'm, I'm out of my time. In verses 24 through 26, we see where Paul's commitment really was laying. No matter how you look at it, you cannot, you cannot steal a man's joy if he possesses a single mind. Sure, you may frustrate him and sure you may uh, irritate him, but you can't steal his joy. You remember we've talked about this multiple times. We're not talking about his happiness. Happiness is a fleeting thing. It is fickle. Happiness comes, happiness goes. We're talking about this inside work of joy. You cannot steal it from the man that has a single mind. Paul's commitment as long as I'm here, I will be laser focused on Jesus and his will for my life. A man by the name of Malty Babcock is the one that wrote, some of you will know this old hymn, that this is my father's world. Y'all remember that song? This is my father's world. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember the words, but you know the song. Okay. Here's what he said. He said that life is whatever it is that we are alive to. In other words, the thing that excites us and really kind of fires up the engine within us, that is the thing that really is life to us. In Paul's case, Paul said, Christ is life. Jesus is life. Christ excited him and made his life worth living. Up until then, he's a Pharisee. Life was really about being judgmental. Life was really about finding those that you could look holier than. By the way, in case you think the Pharisees are extinct, think again. They're everywhere. You'll always find those that are willing to, to cast judgment upon you. We learned about judgment in in, in small group this morning. You'll always find those that are willing to come and say, hey, I'm much holier than you. I'd never do that. 
But when Paul was found by, I was going to say he found Christ. He didn't find Christ. Christ found him. And by the way, that's all of our story. Philippians 1.21 really is an incredible value of a valuable test for our lives. You really could fill in the blanks. For me to live is blank and to die is blank. Fill it in. For some, it'll be for me to live is money and to die is to leave it all behind. I think that's a great tragedy, don't you? To live your entire life trying to earn something that you can't live with for eternity. For some, for me to live is fame and to die is to be forgotten. Think about that. To live is fame. There's so many, we're, we are intoxicated with having our name known, our name mentioned. Paul said, I just live to see that you know his name. I like how John the Baptist said it. I just assume you know my name less and know his name more. For some, for me to live is power, and to die is to lose it all. There are no powerful men in graveyards. None. There are dead men. If we're to have joy in spite of our circumstances, we too must echo his conviction, Paul's convictions. If we are going to live in such a way that for the furtherance of the gospel, we too must have that same motto. For me to live is Christ. And whatever I'm doing, if I'm a coach, I'm going to coach the best of my ability, but my, my heart and my life and my mission is not just about winning games, but it's about winning souls. If I'm a banker, I'm going to do all I can to make money for my bank, to provide an income and a living for my family. But my heart, my lifestyle that everything I do, every transaction is all about the fact, can I give God glory in the midst of this? I mentioned at the beginning a title, and then I departed straightway thereof, like some preachers do with their texts. Crossroads and side streets. Paul was at a crossroads. You and I this morning are at a crossroads. We choose, if we choose wisely, to say from this point on, I'm going to live in such a way that others come to know Christ. If not, we wind up living on side streets to where we could see the will of God. We could see out there others that are on the path that God's given them, but I just can't find a way to get there. Side streets is where you get worked up over things that are not worthy of you being worked up over. Side streets is a place that you go and live your life and waste it. Side streets is a place that will take you, Christian, to the bame of the judgment seat of Christ all the while, finding that you have nothing to show for your life when you arrive. I am as a pastor, as a shepherd, trying to do all that I can to equip us. And I say us because I am right there with you to say, at the crossroads that we are at this morning, choose wisely. Choose for eternity, not just whatever appeases you now, whatever appeases you today. It may be the most difficult path. I would even say it probably will be the most difficult path. But it is the one that gets us all the way to the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, I can't wait for that day to be standing there with an armload of crowns. That when that moment comes, I place him at his feet and I worship him. Lord, this is the life that I've lived. Here are those that have come with me because I've given them the gospel. 